The Bible says, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Crooked thinking is crowding our thinking. Think about it. Crooked thinking about sin is just sinful. Crooked thinking about the Word is growing worse. This is why in Genesis 1 through 11, we have these foundational truths that will equip us and encourage us and enable us to straighten out our crooked thinking. Girls are not boys. Women can get pregnant. Men can't have babies. Men can't bear children. There's only two genders, male and female. A man is an adult male human. A a woman is an adult female human. You can't change your gender just like you can't change your ethnicity. These are simple statements that used to be that simple, but from the world's perspective, not, not what the Word says, but from what the world is saying, it's just simply not that simple. And we're bombarded with all these complex ideas and lies, and it, it, it causes our thinking to get crooked. And praise the Lord for Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis 11. Praise the Lord that He's given us this foundation. That we can know. Here's what the world thinks. If somebody hears something long enough, and if somebody hears something loud enough, then it will become true. And in some cases, for some people, that does become true. But thankfully, we have the foundation, the truth, our final authority for what we believe and how we behave. And God's given us that. And what a great gift this is. To us. So today we're going to be discussing the, the, the question, where did we come from? And when I say we, I'm talking about people. Where did the human race come from? Where did we come from? Well, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through verse 31. I'm going to read the text and then we'll spend some time unpacking it together. So let me just read it together all at one time. Verse 26, if you're there, say I'm there. Here we go, church. Let's go, church. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. God, may you be honored. May you be praised by the reading, the receiving, and the response to your word. And God's people said, so we have a a main idea today, the takeaway that I've, I've worded this way, you matter to your maker, okay? Uh, We matter to our maker. (laughs) Think about that. What we are the, the crowning jewel of our creator. We are, we are important to the I am. We are significant to our Savior. We matter to our Maker. And here's the beauty of this. It matters not our arrogance. <laughs> it matters not our brokenness or our confusion. 
We matter to God, no matter our ego or our fallen nature or our hatred or our jealousy or our ignorance or our lies or our malice or our obstinance or our sin or our rejection or our tolerance. It matters not. We still matter to our maker. If you were to ask me, Pastor, what matters to God? And I were to give you a list of what matters to God. Here's the list. You might want to make a list. Number one on the list of what matters to God, people. That's it. That's the list. What matters to God, people matter to God. People are the pinnacle, the height, the apex of God's creation. Men, women, boys, and girls. We matter to God. So how can you say that? Well, there's this 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 section of chapter 1 gives us at least four reasons we can say yes we matter to God first one is this God made you like it or not he made you Psalm 139 I believe you may have heard that read earlier today I know we did in the early service very clear God knitted us he formed us beautifully wonderfully intricately in our mother's womb he made you Like it or not, God made you. He made me. He made us. You know, this time of year, when I feel bad for peaches. I like peaches. They taste good. But man, I mean, they... Aside from the Chick-fil-A peach milkshake, what has the peach accomplished? Very little. I mean, especially... I mean... What, they hadn't had a hit since, what, the cobbler? I mean, you think about the pumpkin. Pumpkins, I mean, can we not acknowledge the stellar career the pumpkin has had? Constantly reinventing itself. But both the peach and the pumpkin, no matter their stellar career or no stellar career, it doesn't matter, there's one creator who made both of them. And the same creator that made the peach made the pumpkin. And the same creator that made the peach and the pumpkin made you and me. Regardless of how advanced we think we are, how wise we see ourselves in our own eyes, or how advanced we become, or how learned we become, God made us. You are not self-made. You did not make yourself. You have not made it. God made you. He formed you. He took the dust, this raw material that he made, and he formed Adam, and he took the rib from Adam, and he made Eve. And since then, in the womb, he's intricately woving us. Men, women, boys, and girls. He made you, he made me. Here's how the Bible communicates this to us. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Those pronouns, us, our. This is interesting. What is happening here? There's something happening on day six that didn't happen on day one through five. Now, on day one through five, something happened that did happen on day six, and that is God is speaking. That's clear. God is speaking. But on day one through five, God made declarations. Somebody say declaration. God made declarations. He declared, let there be light. There was light. Let there be an expanse. There was an expanse. Let there be water above and below the expanse. So be it. Let there be vegetation sprout. So be it. Let there be living creatures bring forth on the earth. There was. Let there be swarms of creatures swarming the waters. There were. He declared it. It happened. He made declarations on day one through five. When he gets to day six, this is not a simple declaration in verse 26. This is God engaging in deliberation. It's as if he's making a proposal on how to create man. It's as if God is having a conversation with somebody. He's talking to somebody. Who's he talking to? Let us make man. Now, some suggest God is talking to the angels. But there's a problem with that. Look at verse 27. What does verse 27 say? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God. It doesn't say... God created man in his own image, in the image of God and the angels. We weren't created in the image of angels. Now, some of you think you're an angel. (laughs) 
But you were not created in the image of angels. You were created in the image of God. So he's not talking to angels. He's not talking to celestial beings. He's talking to himself. He's having a conversation with himself. Here we see, and I know it's not a fully developed doctrine of the Trinity here. Nobody can argue that. But what we do have here is evidence of a triune God, a plurality of persons, us, our. We see the Spirit back in verse 2, hovering over the face of the waters. Obviously the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, were directly involved. The, the, The God who made you is a very unique God. He's a God that's always existed. One God in three persons. I know the Trinity is oftentimes hard to, I mean, it's impossible for us to grasp totally and accurately, certainly, to its fullness. And we try. There's explanations out there. But I heard one recently that helped me. I want to share it with you. I pray it'll be helpful. Again, this is not original with me. I heard this from a pastor who encouraged me, and I just want to share it with you. When we think about the Trinity and the triune God, a good way to think about that is who and what. Who and what. And, and you, you can do this with anybody you know. I, my favorite person is Tanya Greer. Who is she? She's Tanya Greer. What is she? She's a woman. She's my wife. Right? She's a who and a what. One of my favorite uh, characters from a movie, the Transformer movies, uh, Optimus Prime. Who is he? Optimus Prime. What is he? Well, he's really a truck and a robot, right? So we can say he's, he's one who and two whats. Right? One who, two whats. But when we approach the Bible, what we have presented to us in the Trinity is three who's and one what. Three who's and one what. What is God? He's God. He's the all-existing, never in need of anything God. Okay, but, but who is he? Well, he's God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He's three persons, one God. Three persons, yet one God. That is totally different from any other teaching you'll ever hear in religion or faith anywhere else. The, 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 our God is so unique. That there, there are people in the world that don't believe like us, but they do believe in one God. Our Jewish and Muslim friends believe in one God. But it's not the God we believe in. We believe in this one God existing in three different persons. Jesus said it like this in the Great Commission. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not the names, plural, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the name. One name. Three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So what does this communicate? Here's what this communicates to us is God has always existed in relationship. He's always existed in community. God didn't start loving when you showed up like he had no other opportunity to love. No, he's always loved. God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they've always been in this loving relationship. God is love. He's always been in community and relationship and trinity. This is why isolation is so painful. This is why being alone hurts so much. You, you, man is not meant to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. God created us in this community. So when he says, let us make man in our image, he's talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You were created to love and to be loved. God made you. He made you. Like it or not, God made you. And 27 is pretty clear. The word created is used three times here. It's as if God with an exclamation point is saying, man. It's almost like verse 27 is a poem kind of set off by itself to emphasize three times this word created is used. Saying, hey, man is my prize creation. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So what does this mean? Well, the man there, God created man. That word means, the gen- it's the generic word for mankind. It's not referring to simply male humans. It's referring to all mankind. God created them. He created man. He created him, mankind. He created them, plural, two genders, male, female. Okay? 
God made you. And this means that God, and it's all through Scripture. Nehemiah, Job, the Psalms, the New Testament, Hebrews. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. So what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. He created you. He created me. Now, notice this. This is also something different about the creation of man that is different from the creation of other creatures. Notice what is not here. Over and over ago, we read last week, according to their kinds, according to their kinds, according to their kinds. That is not, that's not used when talking about man because there's only one kind, human beings. In the animal kingdom, there's a lot of different kinds of animals. But with the human race, there's only one human race. People, humans. That's why it's so disrespectful and it hurts God's heart when you and I use language when we're thinking about people or talking with people that are different from us or they believe differently than we do or they behave differently than we do and and, and we speak of them like, well, your kind does this or your kind does that. That hurts God's heart because there's only one kind. Now, sin has messed all that up. We know that. But white, black, Latino, African, Asian, poor, rich... Young, old, teenagers, senior adults, singles, marrieds, all people matter to God. All of them. Even even babies in the womb matter to God. It's crazy what... What you hear around election time, isn't it? It's just insanity. I heard something from some politician the other day that abortion is the answer to inflation. I mean, what? Connect those dots. Or that children need abortion in order to do well in school. What are you talking about? Crazy stuff. Every day should be pro-life day. Because every day, somebody has a birthday. And your birthday is the best day to be a pro-life day because your birthday is a constant reminder that your mama was pro-life. Praise God she was pro-life. Right? I mean, every day should be pro-life day. Every day should be pro-all-of-life day. From aged adults that are fading away in a nursing home from a baby in a womb and everything in between. All people matter to God. Like it or not, He made you. He made me. He made the person next to you. He made your neighbor. He made that person that when you see him coming, you, you hide. He made that person. They matter to Him. God made you like it or not. Secondly, God made you in his likeness. Not only did he make you, but he made you in his likeness. Now here's our problem, and it doesn't matter if we're on the far right, the far left, or somewhere in between. We all have this tendency, we all have this temptation to fashion God in our likeness. God, I want you in my likeness. Your trinity and my trinity, I'm talking about the flesh, not the spirit, but in the flesh, your trinity and my trinity is me, myself, and I. It's not God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We want to take God and make him into our likeness and our image. Reading about Duke Divinity School, I had a chapel speaker that referred to God as... Uh, mother, father, parent, drag queen, trans man, gender fluid, queer one. That's just fashioning him in, in their image. And then on the far other side, the, the, you have the Christian nationalists on the other side that says God loves uh, football, he loves sweet tea, he loves America. And yeah, God does. But he also loves hot tea, soccer, and Asia. Right? He loves all people. Right? And so, but our tendency is to take and fashion him into our likeness. But that's not how the text reads. It says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And I think those words image and likeness, 
what it should do is, is it should cause us to think in form and content. Okay? God is community. So we were made in His image. We're made for community. Yes? Okay? God is intellectual. Yes? He's creative. Yes? He's uh, emotional. Yes? He's, what I mean is He has emotions. I don't mean He's out of sorts. I mean He has emotions. He is uh, spiritual. He is moral. And so we have that. We were created in His image. That we have that volitional, spiritual, intellectual, moral, religious, creative capacities in our emotions and in our will and in our decision making. We have a God conscience that's been given to us that has not been given to animals. Animals don't have that. We are not one of the animals. We're made differently. Our DNA is different. And our blueprint, our DNA is amazing. You're walking around a sheer miracle. You know, in every cell of your body, you have about two meters of of, of coiled up DNA. And if all of that DNA in every cell of your body, if it was unraveled, it would wrap around our solar system twice. That's you walking around. You're a miracle. You matter to God. Made in His likeness, in His image. Unlike the animals. Now, we love animals. Amen? Amen? Yes, take, take a, 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 you know, the mascot for Bucky's, I guess, is a beaver, right? Y'all been to Bucky's, right? All right, the beaver, take the beaver. A beaver, an animal, a beaver, has this ability to build a dam. God, God put that into that animal. It knows how to pile up sticks. But you're not going to hire a beaver to build a hospital. Doesn't have that capacity, doesn't have that capability. We're made differently in that way. We're not one of the animals. Like the director of PETA said, we are not, it is not a rat, is a pig, is a dog, is a boy. No. The director of PETA went on to say, if we're going to kill off species, let's kill humanity first. We only play a minor role in the overall diversity of nature. Well, no, we don't. We're not one of the animals. We didn't, we didn't evolve from eons of evolution. No, we're made differently. Now, do you love your dog? Anybody here dog owners? Yeah, you love your dog? Right? You take your dog for a walk. Anybody take your dog for a walk? You take your dog for a walk, that's social media for the dog. All that sniffing they like to do, and you stop and let them sniff. That's their scrolling on social media. You let them do You love your dog. Right? Now, if you have a cat, you probably love your cat. Maybe. But animals, I don't care if it's a dog, if it's a cat, if it's a fish, no animal, no creature can know God, love God, obey God like we can. Now, with that being said, we do know that creatures that God created, they do what God created them to do. We're the only species that God made that disobeys Him on earth. We're the only ones. Why is that? Well, Pascal said it like this in 1654, this French mathematician came to faith in Christ. And this is what he said. He said, the Christian religion teaches two truths. Number one, that there is a God whom men are capable of knowing. Number two, there's an element of corruption in men that renders them unworthy of God. So you have these two truths. Number one, knowledge of God and knowledge of man's wretchedness. Pascal says, knowledge of God without knowledge of man's wretchedness begets pride knowledge of man's wretchedness without knowledge of God begets despair but Jesus Christ knowledge of him (laughs) gives you both simultaneously furnishes man with both the knowledge of God and the knowledge of our wretchedness simultaneously so yes we are made in the image of God but sin has marred that image Now, it doesn't mean we're still not, we are still image bearers. The Bible tells us that. In Genesis 9, after the fall, the Bible clearly tells us we're still image bearers. For the Bible says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. In James chapter 3, when James is addressing taming this tongue, He says, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil 
full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse, listen to this, people who are made in the likeness of God. So we are still image bearers. Though we're broken, though we're fallen, though the image has been marred, we're still image bearers of God. No matter, you can, all the way from Adolf Hitler to Mother Teresa, we are image bearers of God. We bear the image of God. Now it's been marred, and that was a problem, but there's a solution. God sent His Son, His only Son, Jesus, who the Bible tells us is the exact imprint of God. The Bible says that Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. So Jesus came and he was the perfect image bearer. He was sinless in every way. No deceit was found in his mouth. Perfect. And in his perfection and in his sinlessness, he took upon your sin and my sin on the cross and died for us was buried and raised to life. So this perfect image bearer has come to redeem image bearers of God so that we as the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son so Jesus has come to redeem us as image bearers of God in the image of himself the Bible says since we've been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and all your brokenness In all your sin, you still matter to God. And Jesus has come to restore that relationship between you and God the Father. Why? Because he made you in his likeness. He made you like it or not. Number three, likewise, God made you male or female. He made you male or female. With a definitive gender, male or female. He made you. Now, I've, heard, I've had guys come to me so many times just through ministry and say, Pastor, I want a Proverbs 31 wife. I want a Proverbs 31 woman. You need to tell my wife that she needs to be a Proverbs 31 woman. Are you crazy? <laughs> I'm not telling her that. But I will tell you, so, they'll say, well, well, preach preach on it. Preach on being a Proverbs 31. Okay, I'm going to. But guys, you're not going to like it. But I'm going to tell you anyway. There's a way that you can play a part in having a Proverbs 31 wife and a Proverbs 31 woman. Man, if you want a Proverbs 31 woman, then you need to become a Proverbs 1 through Proverbs 30 man. That's how you have a Proverbs 31 wife. And a Proverbs 31 woman. You do that and both of y'all are in Christ. I promise you you'll have a Proverbs 31 woman. See God's made us different. He's made us unique. As male and female we have different roles. Are we equal in value? Of course. But our roles are different. There's a uniqueness to these two genders. Here's what's so ironic to me. The world says there's what? I don't know how many anymore. 70 plus genders. I don't know. But of all the multiple genders, the world tries to compress them to all be the same. Isn't that so odd? Because there's this push for oneness and sameness. And our roles We are not the same. We are unique. We are different. In value, absolutely, we are the same. Equal in value. But in roles, absolutely not. God is more creative than that. He's more unique than that. We can say it this way. God has given us maleness and femaleness. He says they are not only good. God says they're very good. They're meaningful. Now, if you reject the God-assigned gender that God's given to you, you're, you're rejecting the most basic purpose God has for your life. We can say it like this. A man 
is absolutely superior to a woman at being a man. While a woman is absolutely superior to a man at being a woman. They're unique and they're different. Now, we have to recognize the confusion because there's much of it. And people are hurting. And I know this. And you know this. Dysphoria, whatever you want to call it, there's this gender confusion. But the Bible clearly teaches us that God did not create us to confuse us. That's not why he made you. You are not what your worst day says you are. You are not what your best day says you are. You are not what your feelings say you are. You are not what the latest fad says you are. You're not what other folks say you are. You are what the I am says you are. And, and, and yes, we, we have this longing and this emptiness and this void. And God put it there. He put eternity in the hearts of men. So yes, in a sense, we're trapped. Now, we're not men trapped in women's bodies or women trapped in men's bodies. But we are eternal souls trapped in this temporal tent, this body. And the Bible says we need to be born again. We need to be born spiritually, not physically, but spiritually. We need to be born again. And Christ has come, the perfect image bearer of of God, the exact imprint of God. The very image itself, he's come to make a way for that to happen. He is the one that is spoken of in Genesis 3 that we'll get to in a couple of weeks. It says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Speaking of Christ. So God made you. You matter to him. He made you, like it or not, he made you in his likeness. Likewise, he made you male or female. And then number four, God made you like no other. God made you like no other. You've been given a personality that is different than anybody else on planet Earth. He made you very unique. I I had somebody say something to me the other day. He said, what what do you think I ought to do with leftover bacon? Leftover bacon. I said, "What what is this bacon of which you speak? Left over, what, I've never heard of that kind of bacon. What, what is that? Is that new? Is it good? What is it? When, when God made you, he made you unique. Even more unique than leftover bacon. Unique than anything else that, that you look around and say, wow, that's unique. God made you even more unique than that. He, he put a personality in you that has never been in anybody else. Think about that. Incredible. The creativity of our God. The ability of our God. It says it like this. Look at verse 28. And God blessed them and God said to them. Now, the human race is different. Now, you look back at verse 22. You say, well, there's something similar that's said about the, the creatures the, on the earth and the birds of the heavens and the, and, and, the, and, and the fish in the sea. You can look at verse 22. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. But verse 28 is a little different says that God said to them. God blessed them and said to them. In other words, men, women, boys, and girls have an ability to receive God's word that no other creature does. We can receive his word. God said to them. We can receive. That also means we can reject it. That also means we can disobey. So be good stewards of your obedience to God's word, certainly. But we're unique and we're different in that we can receive his word and we can respond to his word. And he has commanded us here, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful. God wants to populate the earth here. And so his design, you see the creator, God, right? And as far as value, he values man, woman, children, okay? 
creatures, animals, creation. Well, as a society, we flip that. We flip that design. We've got pets, animals, creation up here. Creation is top priority. Then we have people. Then we have God at the bottom. That's, that's backwards. That's flipped. We need to get it right. People are a blessing. They're not a burden. Right? And then he says, be fruitful. Then look at this word, multiply. Man, be fruitful and multiply. That's the same word used in the uh, same idea here in the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. It's a multiplication. It's God sending out his ambassadors, sending out his witnesses, not only to populate the earth, but make sure heaven's populated. How do we do that? We take his word. We take his gospel. We take this commission to the nations from Hamilton County and beyond. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. There, there, there's in a sense that we're like God in that we have this ability to reign or have dominion over. Now, here's what we do. Unlike God, we are harsh with each other. Right? We're harsh with creation. We're, we're harsh with our creator. But even still, God has given us this dominion over us. It's as if God has deputized us, right? Deputized us as his plan A, his only plan to reach the nations is to use people like you and people like me. To populate the world, to populate heaven, his plan is people. That's his plan. He has deputized us. Andy Taylor, the sheriff of Mayberry... Went out of town. So he put Barney Fife in charge. This is not good, is it? Then Barney turns right around and says, I've got a great idea. I'm going to deputize the mechanic Gomer. Boy, this is going south quick, isn't it? So Barney and Gomer, they're patrolling Mayberry, and they notice the bank is being robbed. So they duck behind a car trying to figure out what to do, how to handle this, how to react. And shazam, Gomer says, let's call the police. (laughs) Barney says, we are the police. Look around, church. God has deputized you. He's deputized me in Christ. Not only as image bearers were we created, but we're saved to be fashioned into the likeness of His Son, into Christ, the Lord Jesus. What an incredible opportunity we have to fulfill this great commission, to not only populate the earth, which God, that's His desire, but also to populate heaven. And then God gives us this in the last part of this section, and it's just about food, amen? Who likes food? Yeah, boy, there's food there, amen, amen, food. He says, I'm going to provide you food, I'm going to support you, and all this is for you for food, and I can't imagine what our taste buds are going to do in heaven when we have all this food that has no sin, no tainting. Man, can you imagine the explosion of taste buds? Can't wait, can't wait, much like here. And God said it was very good. But also, we know Jesus says, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So here's two questions, and I'm going to pray. Two questions. One is for believers. One is for unbelievers. Now, as believers, we understand, according to this text, that people matter to God. It's his, his prized creation. The pinnacle of his creation. So people matter to God. The question is, do they matter to you? Do they matter to me? Do people matter to us? Or are they a hindrance? Are they an annoyance? Are they a bother? Or do they matter? Now I know this, and you know this, if if you spend any time in, uh, in any kind of gospel ministry, you know this. That it can be frustrating. There's people in your life you've been praying for, you've been sharing Christ with, you've been loving on them, and they just reject you at every turn. They don't want anything to do with it. Right? 
I mean, for example, what we are going to uh, today give a lot of candy away, right? Giving candy away. And people are going to be here because have you seen inflation and the price of candy? Oh, they're going to be here. In fact, every Halloween we cook hot dogs in our driveway and have people over and just give away food and try to share Christ with people and love on them. And we do that in our driveway. But this year, as, as our candy for trick-or-treaters, we're going to have a candy dispenser. you got to pay to get candy. Hey, somebody's got to pay for it. It's inflation. Sorry. So I know people are going to come to get candy. Right? We're going to give them the gospel, but more people will walk away with candy than they do with the gospel. And that's just, it's, it's always been that way. On November the 17th at 2 p.m., right over here, we're going to give away some turkeys. Because of your benevolent giving to benevolence, we have enough dollars to do turkeys for Thanksgiving. So we're going to get 250 turkeys. We're going to give them away on Thursday, November 17th at 2 p.m., right out here. We're going to have the car line, and we're going to pray over people and share the gospel with people and give turkeys away. But we know more people are going to go home with a turkey than they are the gospel. It's just the way this works. Think about Jesus when he fed the 5,000. What, probably upward of 15,000 with men, I mean with women and children. So he fed these 5,000. And how many after they ate followed him? The Bible says about 500. Not 5,000, but 500. He had 12 disciples. How many of those guys prayed with him in the garden? Three. How many of those three were standing with him at the cross? One. Boy, the closer you get to the cross, the thinner the crowd gets. And when you start sharing the gospel, people start rejecting it. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't matter to us. They still matter to God. They should still matter to us. So live like it. Join us today as we share the love of Christ with people through some candy. Come and be a part of that as we point people to Christ. So that's for the believers. Do people matter to you? Here's for every unbeliever that's listening. Somebody who may be questioning, man, is this Jesus thing real? Should I, should I buy into this? Should I, should I have a conversation with somebody about buying into this? What, what is this all about? Well, let me, let me say it to you like this. According to the Word of God, according to the Bible... You matter to God. The question is, does God matter to you? And the way you can answer that in the affirmative is, okay, yes, he matters to me. So I'm going to turn from my sin. I'm going to trust what Jesus did for my sin. Yes, I'm made in the image of God, but it's marred because of my brokenness and my fallen nature. But Christ has come to bring me back to my creator God, to bring me back to the Father. I'm going to trust in that. I'm going to have faith in that. I'm going to believe that. I'm going to invite the Lord to be the the Lord of my life today. I'm going to ask him to forgive me my sin. I'm going to be saved today. My sins are going to be forgotten today. I'm going to be given forgiveness today. I'm going to be given a home in heaven today. I'm going to start living for Christ today. If if, If you would like to do that, we'd love to help you. So we're going to stand in a moment. We're going to have a time of reflection and response, and you come as the Lord leads you. Would you stand with us, church?